Okay, tonight it is my pleasure to uh, have Dr. Uh, Teasel Muir Harmony uh, from the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. And uh, it's, it's, uh, she's here to talk about Operation Moon Glow, which uh, is a book she wrote uh, right here. And uh, I think you wrote it a couple, it's, it's been out a couple of years, but uh, um, I just finished it today, actually. It was, it was fantastic. Um, there, were, there were several things that I didn't realize, um, and I grew up kind of in that time period, actually. So uh, it's a great perspective on the kind of the political overtones of uh, not only Apollo, but really it starts with, with Sputnik. And, uh, you know, what our politicians were thinking, what our governments were thinking, and how that all kind of tied into the space program. And there were a lot of really cool things um, that, that uh, she discovered and researched and wrote about. And uh, I, I thought it was a fantastic book. Um, Dr. Harmony is a PhD, uh, uh, got her PhD from MIT. She's uh, held various positions throughout the community, including, I think, several at the Smithsonian. Um, teaches at Georgetown University. Um, uh, she's got a long list of accolades. I have to kind of pick and choose here, but uh, she's been on some of the television programs related to Apollo and the moonshots. And uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much Thank for so inviting much for me to join you today. today. Um, uh oh, okay, you turn off your thing. Oh, there's a little feedback, so um, I'm glad that stopped. It's it's really a pleasure. I wish I could join you in person, but hopefully, maybe I'll um, join join you observing sometime soon. Um, uh, I'm excited to hear that you'll you'll be going to Hazi and um, at the end of the month. So uh, it'd be great to join you. I I got interested in the history of science initially. Um, you know, I decided to pursue this this uh, career because of my love of the history of astronomy and studying astronomy in in high school and in college. And so it's such a pleasure um, to join you this evening. Um, all right, so I'll share my screen. All right. Hopefully you all see a, a large moon. Good, good. So this is a picture actually taken by the Apollo 11 crew um, as they were leaving the moon after they were done walking on the lunar surface. It's one of my favorites. But um, to begin, I'll rewind a little bit earlier than that. So uh, and tell you a bit about how I started on this project um, and where it came from. And uh, a number of years ago, I was doing research at the National Archives in, in College Park, Maryland. And I was working on this project on um, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory's partnership uh, with an observatory in Tokyo in Japan and um, they're working on this uh, satellite tracking network together and so I was there doing research on that project in particular and um, but I was really curious about the larger context of US science and technology in Japan at this time and so I requested a few additional boxes that looked promising to give me some more context. And in a manila folder, I found a report that was dated September 4th, 1962. And it described an exhibit at a department store in Tokyo of the Friendship 7 spacecraft. And you can see a, a photograph of a similar exhibit here. And this, this is the spacecraft that John Glenn used to achieve the first American orbital flight. And the report said that over 500,000 people saw the spacecraft in just four days. And this number really shocked me. Um, uh, at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, when it's fully open in the middle of July, when we have our, our largest numbers of visitors, we might, we might get around 100,000 people or so. So this is a huge museum um, and one of the most popular in the world. And so that 500,000 people saw this, the Friendship 7 in, in Tokyo um, in just a few days was a, is a really incredible number. And so I read on and the report described several hundred police and guides channeling the crowd of uh, visitors up stairs, um, nine flights of stairs. They, they went across the roof and then came back down nine flights of stairs to the exhibit hall to see the spacecraft. And so the scale and level of interest in the exhibit was hard for me to comprehend. And I knew that John Glenn became a, 
important part of American history, um, but I wanted to know what his significance was in Japan and what was the significance of this spacecraft exhibit. And I wondered if the story hinted at something larger and something more fundamental about the ties of early spaceflight and foreign relations. And so I continued to look into the story and I soon discovered that this record-breaking exhibit in Tokyo was no chance event. Uh, I found example after example of similar exhibits. So here you can see people in Pakistan and Cambodia, and here's the Philippines. So the exhibit in Japan was part of an international tour that was humorously dubbed the fourth orbit. So John Glenn orbited the earth three times in his spacecraft. And so this global diplomatic tour uh, exhibit of the spacecraft was called the fourth orbit. So it was the fourth time it traveled around the world. And this was also the first large scale US space diplomacy program of its kind. And in just three months, the spacecraft visited over 20 cities around the world and was seen by about 4 million people. And while another 20 million people watched television programs broadcast from the exhibit site. So this is also at a time when the world population is um, 3.1 billion people. So here you can see the spacecraft. Um, uh, as it looked like before it was launched and what it looks like today um, at the Air and Space Museum. And seeing the spacecraft today can help us appreciate what people saw in 1962 at that exhibit. And you can see um, how atmospheric re-entry left its mark on the spacecraft, especially if you look at the painted American flag and the words Friendship 7 on the, the image, uh, <laughs> the, the historic image on the left. Um, this wear and tear can make space quite come alive as it did for people in 1962. Um, and as I quickly learned, this, this fourth orbit um, diplomatic tour was part of a much larger, more extensive US initiative to foster political alignment through demonstrations of scientific and te technological preeminence. And spaceflight became one of the major national priorities in the early 1960s, and this owes much to the Cold War and spaceflight's role in foreign relations. And so while many historians um, of Project Apollo have focused on how we sent humans to the moon, uh, today I'm gonna focus on why the moon landing was a truly global event and why this matters. So moving ahead a little bit, um, during the transition from Eisenhower to Kennedy, the future of human spaceflight was um, in question. Uh, both Eisenhower and Kennedy expressed skepticism about how expensive human spaceflight was and, and in particular how expensive it would be to send humans to the moon. So neither of them thought this should be a national priority at that time. Um, but a few things changed in the spring of 1961 um, and uh, a few important details for spaceflight. One is uh, the Soviet Union's successful launch of Yuri Gagarin in April. So this is the first human spaceflight. And um, the news was covered worldwide. And um, while the launch of the satellite Sputnik in 1957 by the Soviet Union was said to have shocked people and it had major uh, repercussions when it came to um, uh, politics within the United States, education, security, all sorts of other areas. Um, Gagarin's flight was said to have impressed people around the world. Um, and that, that was seen as quite important to Kennedy that um, that achievement really impressed the world public. And then in short succession, about a week later, um, there was the failure at the Bay of Pigs, and this is a CIA-backed invasion of Cuba. And this was a, another blow to US prestige. Um, so two in quick succession, Kennedy asked his advisors to find him a space program that promises dramatic results um, that we can win. And that's how he put it. Um, he wanted to win, he wanted dramatic results. That was an important part um, of the goal. Uh, Lyndon Johnson and others um, got back to him with a proposal um, and he ended up um, presenting it to Congress um, on May 25th of 1961. Um, shortly before that, Alan Shepard became the first American in space with a brief suborbital flight and that gave Kennedy and others the confidence to propose Project Apollo. We'll skip ahead um, to that speech and I wanted to share some of the details of it with you because if you've heard it or if you read part of it, you've probably um, heard the, the last five minutes when Kennedy proposes sending humans to the moon, uh, landing them safely there and returning them back to Earth before the end of the decade. 
But this was part of a much longer speech, about 30 minutes long, and um, it was on the nation's urgent needs to a joint session of Congress. Um, and that context uh, is really important for understanding why Kennedy would commit the nation to something like Apollo, um, which would be extraordinarily costly um, and require the efforts of hundreds of thousands of people. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, some of the, the, uh, the earlier part of that address. And here are a few quotes from it. So he starts off by talking about a battle that was taking place in the lands of the rising people. So he's talking about Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East. And he said a global revolution was underway. And if the United States did not act decisively, the adversaries of freedom would ride the crest of the wave to capture it for themselves. And this warning gives us insight into one of the major reasons why a nation invests in costly engineering and scientific programs um, beyond um, technical and scientific ends. In the 1940s, World War II had upended the global order and the United States and the Soviet Union not, um, were not only dominant powers, they became competing powers. In addition, there was a wave of independent movements uh, led to the disintegration of European empires. So between 1945 and 1970, the number of nations increased nearly fourfold around the world. So in 1960 alone, the year that Kennedy was elected president of the United States, 17 African colonies became independent nations. There's major changes taking place around the world. And the United States and the Soviet Union stepped in and they competed to guide that transformation. And each superpower attempted to create a global coalition aligned with its respective ideologies. So while the United States sought to foster and spread liberal democracy, the Soviet Union advocated for communism. And simultaneously, the development of nuclear weapons in the 1940s also upended how wars were waged. So the United States and the Soviet Union staged proxy wars and covertly backed coups, but much of their geopolitical influence came from soft power rather than coercive force. So they focused on winning the hearts and minds of the world, and they tried to convince people that either democracy or communism was the best political system to pursue. Nuclear stalemate really elevated the significance of propaganda and psychological strategy for both superpowers. And this is, this is the context in which Kennedy proposed Project Apollo. This is a quote from the section of the speech where he proposes Apollo. Um, and I think it's so important to pay attention to how he frames it, um, why he tells the nation that this should be uh, um, uh, one of the urgent national needs. And so for Kennedy, sending humans to the moon and returning them safely back to the earth uh, was part of the battle going on around the world between freedom and tyranny. So that's how he puts it. It was not simply about securing American prestige and projecting technological capability. Spaceflight, he said, was impacting the minds of men everywhere who were attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. And the road he's talking about is liberal democracy versus communism. And so um, for Kennedy, he, sent, he set multiple goals. He set the goal of sending humans to the moon, but he also set this goal of winning the hearts and minds of the world. And that's, um, I think, an essential part of the larger Apollo story. So a few basics about the Apollo program. Uh, if those are some, some might be less familiar with them, but there were 11 crewed missions between 1961 and 1972. There were six lunar landing missions, which meant that 12 people walked on the lunar surface. Um, the last time was in 1972. They collected about 842 pounds of lunar samples uh, during those visits. And um, the cost of the program was about $25 billion at the time. The cost of the, the entire lunar effort um, in today's dollars would be about $280 billion. So by the mid 1960s, this was over 4% of the federal budget, and you also had um, hundreds of thousands of people spread across the country working on this program. Um, and to put it into perspective, so this was, it cost 18 times what the country spent on the Panama Canal and more than five times the expense of the Manhattan Project. So an incredible um, investment. And it, and it required um, the development of new skills. So when Kennedy proposed Apollo, 
The US had 15 minutes of human spaceflight experience with Alan Shepard's brief suborbital flight. Uh, so you had to learn how to, uh, about long duration spaceflight, the, the impact of long duration spaceflight on the human body, about rendezvous and docking, um, spacewalking. So uh, Project Gemini, you can see an image from it here was really essential for building that knowledge and expertise. The United States also had to build an incredible amount of new hardware. So this is part of that. This is the Saturn V launch vehicle. This was the largest rocket booster the United States had ever built. It stands 363 feet high. And at the very tip top there, there's a three stage of this three stage rocket. There's um, a spacecraft, which is a multi-stage spacecraft as well. So here's part of that. This is, um, you can see in the diagram, uh, where it was located in relationship to the Saturn V. So this is the command module, and this particular one is actually um, Cl uh, Columbia command module from Apollo 11. This is um, this is at the Smithsonian, and this is part of my collection. And it's um, uh, it was basically the astronauts' home um, on the mission, and um, and it also had to have a very elaborate and highly advanced. Um, uh, thermal system to withstand temperatures up to 500,000 degrees. And so um, the heat shield is an important part of the development of this spacecraft. Um, there's a lot to say about it, uh, but that's all I'll say for now. Um, here's a shot of the interior to give you a sense. So um, uh, the main control panel at the bottom of the picture there, those are uh, what are called couches or basically seats where the astronaut sat. Um, at launch, Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon, sat on the far left. Um, Michael Collins, command module pilot, was on the far right. And then Buzz Aldrin was in that middle seat. And um, I'll point out a few things for you. So this is the display and keyboard for the Apollo guidance computer, um, also known as the disk key. Uh, right here, these are switches for abort, boost, and entry. Over here, this is the reaction control system and environmental controls. Um, oh, sorry, the first, that was telecommunications, and this is the reaction control system. Um, slow to, to change my uh, buttons. Okay, and then moving on, this is another part of the spacecraft. Um, this is the lunar module. This, this particular one is lunar module two. This is also at the Air and Space Museum. You can come see it. It's in the, the downtown location of the museum. And, um, it's a two-part spacecraft, so two astronauts would have landed on the moon in a craft like this and uh, walked around on the lunar surface and then um, got back into the top hat, the ascent, half the ascent stage, and then um, launched from the moon. And then they would have joined the command module, which was orbiting around the moon um, with, uh, for Apollo 11, Mike Collins inside, um, their colleague, and then they would have headed back to Earth. As a very brief overview, but uh, we'll move along. Um, so as I mentioned a few times, so um, important part of Apollo was not just building this hardware and, and uh, developing this expertise, but also winning the hearts and minds of the world. And this involved a, a global worldwide public relations initiative headed up by the US Information Agency. Now this is a it's an agency that no longer exists. It was created by President Eisenhower in 1953 to consolidate the US's overseas information efforts. And they had an extremely elaborate program related to space flight. Um, and so you can see some examples of exhibits, um, uh, space related exhibits that they designed over this period of time. They had um, hundreds of thousands of film screenings, exhibits, pamphlets and books, radio broadcasts, spacecraft tours, um, like the Friendship 7 spacecraft tour and astronaut appearances. Here's an example of um, some of the astronaut tours uh, and, and also um, scientists who are working in the Apollo program would also tour the world and um, promote American space flight uh, in their travels. And the, another image, um, this, is, this is a photo of uh, Neil Armstrong and uh, Dick Gordon. Um, in Santiago, Chile from 1966. And I like to share this image because Armstrong was extremely talented when it came to engaging with international audiences. And he put a lot of effort in learning about local cultures, learning local languages, so phrases, um, so that he could connect uh, with the people that he met. 
And um, according to his biographer, that um, this was influential in 1969 when he was selected to be the first person on the moon. So it really illuminates the importance of diplomacy uh, to space flight. So we'll skip ahead <laughs> to the end of the 1960s, 1969. The United States was ready to send humans to the moon with the Apollo 11 mission. And ahead of that flight, the USIA initiated the largest public relations campaign in world history to take full advantage of the foreign relations potential of the mission. And years of programming and events around the world had taught them that too much emphasis on the fact that the moon landing was an American accomplishment Images of the US flag or statements about American greatness and power did not come across well to international audiences. And they recognized that it would be politically advantageous to not only foster a global audience for the first lunar landing, but to encourage a sense of participation in the event. And they did this a number of ways. Um, so they had thousands of radio features, TV programs, and films leading up to the mission. They distributed stories and photographs to thousands of newspapers around the world. They worked with journalists around the world and even brought some of them to the United States um, to meet with experts um, here and then return to their respective countries um, to be experts in the American space program. So they distributed thousands of books and pamphlets and also souvenirs. Um, so uh, to give you an example, um, there was a, a souvenir um, button pin that was distributed in, um, in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, they distributed over 100,000 of them and each button depicted a graphic lunar module that was superimposed on the face piece of the astronaut's helmet with the word Apollo written in bold. And the buttons came in the colors of the American flag, so red, white, and blue, but they did not include any direct reference to the United States. And reports said that everyone in Warsaw was wearing these buttons. They were running out of these types of buttons around the world. Uh, They're extremely popular. Um, they had space exhibits. You can see some examples here. Um, and to give you a sense of sort of the scale of this effort, in Japan alone, nearly a million people visited the 36 Apollo 11 exhibits that were scattered across the country leading up to the flight. Um, there were also other types of exhibits, so Apollo 8 hardware on display in Europe, um, exhibits in the windows of embassies in places like Bulgaria. Uh, they um, set up small kiosk ex exhibits and in any location that would take them. And then in West Germany, um, they made arrangements with department stores, 180 department stores, to have Apollo window displays. Um, you can see an example of that here. Uh, and this is another important part of the story. So in the 1960s, the U.S. built up a global communications infrastructure that not only supported space missions, um, tracking and keeping the astronauts in touch with mission control, but also enabled a global audience to watch the first lunar landing live on television all together. So the Apollo network, which is a series of ground stations around the world, were used in conjunction with the Intelsat communication satellite system to bring TV coverage of the moon landing to a global audience. And... Um, this is a unique moment, it's worth mentioning. So by 1969, the number of television sets around the world had grown nearly 20 fold between the mid 1950s and, and 1969. So it reached about 150 million. Um, so, and in places where there weren't TV sets, uh, the US set them up in exhibits to make them more accessible to people or they had projectors in large outdoor squares and they would either play the live coverage uh, if it was accessible or play, um, uh, space documentaries, films, and then they would play the live radio broadcast along with them. And to give you an example of the coordination and the efforts involved in, in, in building up this global audience, um, in Venezuela, there was no satellite ground station to receive the television feed from the Intelsat satellite network. And so um, the US government worked with Venezuela and Colombia to arrange to have um, a ground station sent there in time uh, for the mission. And this became the first international event seen live in these two countries, um, and it was seen on 1.5 million television sets. And this is an example of a stamp. So many countries around the world produce their own stamps to celebrate the mission. This is the example from Venezuela. So in addition to this, the um, uh, 
the White House and NASA and the State Department worked together to set up a symbolic activities committee. They were interested in making sure that the astronauts' um, gestures on the moon uh, would have uh, important foreign relations benefits. And so um, the symbolic activities committee was in charge of planning out these symbolic activities the astronauts would do on the moon. They met a number of times. There were some ideas that um, uh, they chose not to go with. So one example is that someone had the idea that they could invite poets from around the world to compose poetry and um, that, about the moon, and that would be set to the sent up to the moon. Um, another idea was to, to deposit uh, a microfiche copy of the basic documents of all major world religions. Uh, what they did decide to do is they invited um, leaders from 73 nations or more than 73 nations around the world to compose messages that would be left on the moon and, and 73 um, decided to participate. And those were inscribed on a silicon disc about the size of a US half dollar and it was brought to the lunar service and left there. You can see an example of that, that disc here in this picture. They also brought up a gold olive branch as a symbol of peace and um, they brought up items related to the astronauts that had perished, so both from the Apollo 1 mission as well as Soviet cosmonauts. They brought up miniature flags from all countries around the world, and then they ended up bringing those back to Earth afterwards um, to give as diplomatic gifts along with lunar samples. Uh, one thing that was heavily debated ahead of the lunar landing was whether or not the astronauts should raise an American flag on the moon. Um, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty had said that no nation could claim sovereignty of the moon, and the State Department really worried that if the United States raised a flag on the moon, it would symbolically suggest um, a claim and territory, or it would be seen in a negative light uh, by people around the world. Um, the USIA said, you know, maybe instead we should raise a, a UN flag or they had the idea to take soil from every continent and spread it over the, the lunar surface. Um, but eventually members of Congress rejected this idea. They rejected the idea of a UN flag and they had said that US taxpayers paid for Project Apollo, so an American flag should be raised on the moon. They threatened NASA's funding. Um, NASA said that American flag would be raised on the moon and then they received their uh, appropriations um, with an additional line in it about um, uh, the need to plant an American flag on the moon. Um, it, uh, but it was highly contentious at that time. Um, here's another part of the symbolism of the Apollo 11 mission. So the, the patches that appeared on the astronaut spacesuits and um, and other things related to the mission. Now, those were designed by the crew traditionally. So the crew decided um, that they wanted to symbolize that this was a mission for all humankind. And so they decided to write out Apollo 11 with the numeral 11 as opposed to um, the word in English 11 so that it could be more accessible to people who did not speak English. Um, they also decided to leave their their names off the patch. It was, it was sort of common practice to put your last name on your patch. You can see other examples, but they decided they wanted this to be inclusive and not just about the crew members, but this was about something larger. A fun detail here is that uh, the way that it's drawn, the shadow um, is on the moon in an incorrect place. It should have been um, on the bottom half. I'm not the moon, the, the Earth. So the way the Earth is portrayed with the shadow uh, is not quite right. It should have been on the, the lower part um, of the Earth, but they, they left it as is. So uh, they were ready to launch on July 16th, 1969. Um, they launched from Florida at um, 9.32 a.m. And over 800 foreign correspondents covered the mission um, and uh, in 33 languages. And as, there, as the astronauts made their three-day journey to the moon, television and radio stations around the world contacted local um, U.S. representatives and uh, public affairs officers, and they invited them to appear on Apollo theme broadcast. And um, an estimated 80% of Netherlands' total population of 12 million were following this, this early stage of the flight. And supposedly gas stations in Holland were distributing moon maps instead of road maps. So this is something that 
people are watching around the world. You can see an image here of an audience in South Korea watching it on a large screen um, in a group. And this is this was common around the world. Um, so Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the lunar surface on July 20th, 1969 um, at 4.17 p.m. And at that 17 p.m. Yeah. And at that moment, there were celebrations around the world. So there's great stories of people going into the streets and, and cheering um, and uh, uh, leaders of nations around the world uh, saying that it's going to be a national holiday, uh, people getting off of work and out of school, uh, people naming their babies after the astronauts. There was just great um, celebration around the world. And um, a great sort of fact I like pulling out is that power companies reported a surge in energy consumption because of all the TV sets and living room lights that were left on to follow uh, the mission. So about six hours after they landed, Armstrong was ready to leave the spacecraft. And, but before he descended the ladder, he paused at what's called the porch at the top of the ladder and he pulled the lever with his left hand. And this released an equipment bay, which held a TV camera. Uh, so he made sure that everyone back on earth could watch the first steps on the moon. This was planned as part of the mission. And this became the largest television audience in history and the first truly global live global television broadcast. Um, then he jumped onto the last rung and then onto the foot pad. This is where the television camera uh, was located. And so uh, with one foot on the pad and one foot on the surface, um, he said that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He tested the ground and he started taking pictures. Now this image in particular, this is actually taken by Buzz Aldrin and this is his footprint. Um, and it, it actually reveals a lot about the lunar surface and the lunar soil, um, that it's fine grained, its cohesiveness and its ability to pack tightly together. So this, this was an important scientific image as well. So about 20 minutes later, Buzz Aldrin joined Neil Armstrong on the lunar surface. In total, they spent about two and a half hours um, so uh, relatively short, and then their entire stay on the moon was just under a day. And um, all of the, the astronauts on all the missions, as I mentioned, collected a, a little over 840 pounds of lunar samples, and um, in addition to doing other things on the lunar surface. So um, this is an example of some of the tools that they, they used. Um, to, to collect the lunar samples. These are from training, um, uh, but it gives you um, a sense of what they were working with because of their bulky EVA suits. Their, their movement was really constrained. Um, and so they had to have these um, specially engineered tools um, that compensated for these restrictive suits. So they had tongs and scoops and rakes and hammers, all sorts of things, electric drills. Um, here's an example of um, an astronaut um, preparing to collect a lunar sample. So they wore a checklist on their arms with a detailed sample collection schedule for the mission, but there was some flexibility um, in, in their sampling if they found something particularly interesting. And um, they often photographed the samples in place before they scooped them up. up. And so they recorded the, the context of the material for later scientific analysis. And they would place each sample in a bag with a unique identification number. And the astronauts would gather these bags together and place them in a larger sample collection bag and then carry the rocks back to the lunar module and then place them in a rock box to transport them to Earth. And here you can see an example of um, one of the rock boxes in our collection. Although I think this one is from Apollo 12. Um, and there's a great story. So. Armstrong and Aldrin collected all the samples they were meant to collect and Armstrong realized there was more space in the rock box. So he took a, sho he took a shovel um, and, and uh, then ended up dumping some extra soil from the lunar surface. Um, and it's known as Armstrong's packing soil. So it's sort of fine grained particles. Um, and uh, this is maybe the most studied geologic sample in history. It's one of the most important things that any of the astronauts collected on the lunar surface. And it was just sort of a last minute decision on his part to fill up that empty space. Um, and 
um, the containers here, they're constructed of aluminum and stainless steel and, um, and then they were sealed and then the steel mesh pads and the boxes protected the samples from damage during re-entry and splashdown and then they were brought to the Lunar Sample Laboratory in Texas um, and you can see an example of some technicians working with those lunar samples. Um, the astronauts also um, contributed to science in another way. Uh, so with the early Apollo surface experiments package, um, later missions would have more elaborate um, uh, scientific packages called LSEPs, but the Apollo 11 crew carried this sort of simple version um, and it included a laser ranging retro reflector, a passive seismic experiment and solar wind composition experiment. And uh, uh, I thought the laser ranging retro reflector experiment might be of most interest to this group. Um, so I'll highlight it here. So it's about the size of a suitcase. This is a picture of the one that's in the Smithsonian's collection, and it consists of a series of corner cube mirrors designed to reflect an incoming light beam back to exactly where it came from. And scientists time how long it takes for a laser light to travel from Earth to the moon and back, which is about 2.5 seconds, um, and they can use this to calculate the distance to the moon. It also provides data that's useful for determining the moon's orbit and the rate at which the moon is receding from the Earth. So every year the moon drifts about an inch away from the Earth. And um, these were deployed on the lunar surface um, with a, on Apollo 11 and then also 14 and 15. And uh, the first successful lunar laser range uh, measurements were taken uh, by Lick Observatory in, on August 1st, 1969. They used the 120 inch Shane telescope, which was the second largest telescope in the world at this time. And it gave them an advantage for detecting the signal. Um, and then other observatories um, around the world uh, also participated. So. Um, in addition to Lick, there was also the McDonnell Observatory and um, an observatory in France, the Tokyo Astronomical Observatory. So um, a number of people participating in this experiment around the world. So as I mentioned, there were symbolic activities that took place on the moon. This is an example of those. Um, this is a plaque that was left on the lunar surface. And it says, here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon. July 1969 AD, we came in peace for all mankind. Now this was something that was designed and developed by the White House, State Department, Library of Congress. Uh, many, many people had their hands in, in crafting this. And um, some of the symbolism there, I'll point out um, the decision to depict the Earth's hemispheres with no political boundaries. And so this is supposed to communicate that this is, this is something that all humankind is doing. This is representing humanity, not just the United States. Although uh, President Nixon's name is on the plaque. Nixon called the astronauts from the Oval Office. He congratulated them and he pointed out that um, because of what you have done, the heavens have become part of man's world. And he said, for one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this earth are truly one. Which I think really underscores this larger messaging about how this is um, something that people around the world are experiencing together, that this isn't just an American accomplishment and mission, this is something much larger and grander than that. So here's an example of <laughs> some of those people that are watching the, the lunar landing around the world and following that flight. Um, and I think it's important to note that when people were following the flight on their television sets or in the newspapers, they weren't just seeing images of the astronauts on the moon, they were also seeing images like this of the audiences. And so there was um, this sort of feedback loop or messaging that this was something that everyone on the earth was doing together, um, participating in together. Um, so part of the experience of following the first lunar landing uh, was recognizing and seeing that the rest of the world was following it as well. And there's a great story. So when the astronauts returned to earth and they were in quarantine, they first got to see uh, the television coverage of their mission, the newspaper coverage of their mission, and, and Buzz Aldrin turned to Neil Armstrong and he said, it looks like the whole world was having a party and we missed the whole thing. 
which uh, is a funny comment, but it also speaks to this idea that what was happy on the lunar surface was an important part of the first lunar landing and Apollo more generally. So there's one person who did not get to watch Armstrong and Aldrin's first steps on the moon, and that is Michael Collins, the command module pilot. And you can see him pictured here. It was his job to stay in the command module orbiting the moon as Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the lunar surface. And as his spacecraft swung behind the moon, he was blocked from all radio communication with his crewmates, as well as the rest of humanity back down on Earth. And a NASA official commented dramatically that not since Adam has any human known such solitude as Mike Collins is experiencing. But this sense of solitude would not last long. And um, what really impressed on Collins most on, as he returned to Earth was not the isolation of space travel, but its unifying effects. After their mission, the Apollo 11 crew traveled the world. They visited over 20 countries in two months. And here you can see them at their first stop in Mexico, in Mexico City. And I spoke to Collins um, decades after the moon landing and he told me uh, what he discovered on returning to planet Earth was the opposite of what he experienced orbiting the far side of the moon, a profound sense of community. And he said, I thought that when we went to different countries that people would say, you Americans achieved X, Y, Z, that everywhere the astronauts went, it was we, we human beings, we did it, we did it. That was a punchline everywhere we went. And that use of we instead of you Americans or you astronauts really attests to the profound sense of collective participation felt by billions of people when humans first set foot on the moon. Uh, so just a few concluding remarks. The Apollo program not only taught us about the formation of the moon and our solar system, um, it had tangible and immediate impact on U.S. foreign relations from creating what were seen as apolitical opportunities for U.S. diplomats to meet with local leaders. It displaced negative newspaper headlines of the Vietnam War and U.S. race relations. And um, then there were also things like the Giant Step Tour that I just mentioned, uh, with the astronauts traveling the world, or President Nixon, he took his Operation Moonglow diplomatic tour after um, the mission to promote his new foreign relations agenda. But so beyond this immediate impact and these scientific discoveries, Apollo also revealed an important lesson about being an effective global leader. So public diplomats focus on another measure of the impact of the US space program. And they asked if the sense of unity brought about by Project Apollo and Apollo 11 programming signaled an emerging, emerging new dimension in the international political process, comparable to the experience of unity that might be expected to emerge from such global disasters as a world epidemic, a meteor collision, or a nuclear accident. The commentary around the world, they reported, stressed that the lunar landing was an achievement for all humankind. And this is exactly what Michael Collins observed as well. And um, the, the report emphasized that there was a, an express sense of solidarity of the human community, a sense apparently heightened by the awareness that the whole of mankind was sharing the emotions and the exhalation of a single experience. So to conclude, for Apollo to win hearts and minds, to advance US national interests, to achieve that goal that Kennedy sent at, set out in 1961, it required not only landing humans on the moon, it also required foregoing the message of national achievement in favor and encouraging global participation and a sense of the unity of humankind. So thank you so much for your attention. I'll stop sharing my screen now. And then if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, okay. Yeah. Teasel, thank you so thank much. You so that much. Was terrific. Terrific. Now, let me see. Let me see. Got, somebody's Sorry. got the mic open. Is that any better? Maybe that's better. Somebody might have an open mic, but uh, thank you so much. I mean, like I said, I, I finished your book uh, this weekend, and I really was struck by the by the not only the photographs that you showed, which you know I had never seen before, these astronauts being paraded in all these countries. You you know you barely ever heard of because I think I think you said because we had tracking stations and we had you know an interest there. So I thought that was that was really good, and and like you said, just the just the sense of this was a global event and a community and um you know you made the point that this kind of led the uh the you know the space race between the soviets and the americans and how we sort of 
had a leg up just because we were so open about everything that we did versus their their programs were really kind of almost classified and uh, just that openness really contributed to uh, a lot of a lot of goodwill so a uh, great great book great uh, to have you here i want to give away another book though so um, let's do that and then we'll get to questions okay so uh, give me one second here and uh, I'll come up with a more sophisticated way to do this maybe next time, but um, hang on one. Okay. Okay. Uh, Karen Nishioki. Is Karen still on? <laughs> Somebody chatted, pick me. <laughs> Hello, Karen. We'll see if she uh, can uh, unmute, maybe, while she's doing Hi that. there. Yes. <laughs> OK. Oh, sorry. little feedback. Okay. Yep, I think, uh, I think we have your contact information, Karen. Uh, but you could, you could send it to us if you want. And send me an email, um, or we'll look you up in our roster. Okay. But uh, congratulations. You'll enjoy the book. Thank you. So, OK, that's great. Okay, Thank that's you great. so Thank much. You. Yep. Okay, so let's go to questions. Um, and I want, so let me let me go through the chat box first and we'll see. And then I got a couple I wanted to ask too, but from Frank, uh, Frank, do you wanna uh, ask your question? <clears throat> see if Frank's still on. If not, I think I wrote it down too. Um, All right, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I had, my, I had to unmute. <laughs> I've read an awful lot of really interesting history books that's come out uh, over the years about the space program and uh, a lot of stuff that was never released or talked about much and things like that. And uh, one of the, the things I've always been curious about that was never mentioned was you talked about John Glenn's flight, which is one of the first orbital flights. Glenn was instructed to leave his retro pack attached because they had a warning on the ground that his um, a heat shield warning that his heat shield is actually separated from the spacecraft. Uh, and they never really told John Glenn about the issue until quite a ways afterwards. And he was one pissed off individual afterwards. And from what I understand, that actually changed the way NASA handled their crews after that. My question is this, and this is one thing I've never read. Was that warning a real warning or was it, was it ever determined if it was a real warning or a false warning? Uh, so I believe it was a false warning, um, and they were just hoping that that was the case, and they knew that Glenn wasn't able to do anything to fix it anyways um, from his position on the spacecraft, and so um, they decided not to tell him, but it turned out to be just a false warning as far as I know. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, cool. Um, okay, John, you had a question. Yeah, that's a good one. John. Uh, mine was... Had it not been for the political urgency of the time, have you developed an estimate when we may have landed on the moon? Would it have been 20 years later, 30 years later, or now? It is a great question. And I can tell you um, with, with confidence, it wouldn't have been 1969. <laughs> I don't have a great estimate of when it, it would have been. There was at the time enough interest in, in space exploration and enough people working interested in working in that area and, and promoting it um, that um, the sort of trajectory was headed that way, but the timeline was compressed because of this Cold War context. And so we might have also had a space program that looked really different and that perhaps didn't invest so much in human spaceflight. Um, so Eisenhower, for instance, was less interested in human spaceflight uh, and concerned about the cost of it. So if it wasn't for this sense that, you know, it's humans that um, ignite the imagination of the world, um, we might have invested more in, in satellites, for instance, um, or, you know, orbiting observatories or something else. Um, but the sort of particulars of a human spaceflight and Apollo, all of those are really contingent on that moment. But I think we, I don't know if we would have gotten to the moon. Uh, we definitely would have done things in space, probably with humans, but it would have just been on a very different timeline. And it would probably have been um, 
there probably would have been a space station before we got to the moon. That would have been the sort of what was seen as the nat natural progression at the time was something like a space station and then next lunar exploration. Mm -hmm. hey, Thank you. But wouldn't that depend on what the Russians would do? Because I think the Russians would, would have tried to go to the moon. Well, so that Cold War context and the, the interest in competing with, with the Soviet Union uh, was essential to the decision to send humans to the moon and um, sort of some, some ideas about uh, sort of knowledge of Russian capability. Um, and one of the things that was really important was this idea that um, landing humans on the moon would require both the United States and the Soviet Union to build a brand new rocket. And so it would sort of level the playing field a bit. So many of these sort of the elements of the Apollo program, uh, not only landing humans on the moon, that objective, but all, all sorts of dimensions of spaceflight were really contingent on what the Soviet Union was doing and on the Cold War context, and also, especially on sort of the emergence of these newly independent nations and the potential to influence them. So all of it is so tied together. Did you have what, any, what, what, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, just real quick on that same kind of thread. Did you have any um, research from the Russian side that you had access to of any sort? Like what their politicians were really thinking or doing or any of that kind of stuff? So for the Russian side, I, I really relied on historians of the, the Russian space program. And um, because of what I was doing with my, um, my work was really focusing on what the United States was doing and how they viewed Russia and how they sort of viewed the larger situation. I felt okay with just using um, sources, both American archives. And then I went, I traveled around the world and did archival research in other countries, but not Russian archives, but there's, okay. There's such great, rich uh, material to draw on on the Russian space program, and I was really grateful that that was out there. So that's what I what I used in my book. Sounds good. Okay, Frank. Sorry, uh, that's okay. Um, from what I've read in the past uh, about the history, from some of these histories, is the Russians really were not capable uh, by then because they had lost so many engineers in a launch accident. They lost some of their top engineers in a pad explosion because of a launch accident uh, and and I also do remember that Apollo 11 was actually racing a Russian unmanned landing that ended up just crashing on the moon and they were really concerned that that might actually interfere with the Apollo 11 uh, trajectory or, or landing itself uh, but I mean from what I understand that the Russians from what I have read that the Russians actually had abandoned even um, pursuing a moon landing because of their technical, because they've lost so many of their important people in that pad explosion and because of other political things. Is that true? So the, the Russian um, program, the, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, there are a number of different things, but they didn't abandon sending humans to the moon until later. Um, uh, there was still interest and there was still sort of work being done. There was, there was a, um, explosion of the, the n1 engine um or the n1 rocket uh the the rush the, the large russian rocket not long before the apollo 11 mission um part of their life the, the, with the soviet program they had two uh lunar exploration programs um so that was an issue because that required more funding and um, there was limited funding uh, they did lose a number of their really important um engineers and scientists, um, also just from nat natural causes. Um, uh, so uh, that that was a huge hindrance. Um, there were So there were a number of different factors at play, um, but they were racing the United States to the moon with humans. Um, and even up until Apollo 8, which is December of 1968, it was a real, uh, there was a real chance and real concern that the Soviet Union uh, would send a flyby mission to the moon before the United States. That's part of what encouraged the United States to sort of 
speed up the schedule for Apollo 8. Um, so I could go into a lot of detail there, but uh, from the Soviet side, there are a number of different factors um, at play. So problems with, uh, with rocket development, problems with funding and having multiple programs mm -hmm. at once, and then the loss of really key people in the program, um, and also uh, the larger political context. So lots of things going on, um, uh, which prevented them from sending humans to the moon. All right, let's go to Tom. Tom Reinhardt. Hi. Um, Apollo was a huge project with Herculean program management and logistical demands. The only thing I can think of comparable was the D-Day invasion of Normandy. That was 25 years earlier. I'm wondering whether there was any more direct connection on either personnel or management techniques from D-Day to Apollo. That's a great question. I, I have not heard of any. I've not come across it. Doesn't mean that it wasn't the case, but um, not from uh, not from what I know. There were many people who were working on the Apollo program that had military background and experience from uh, both World War II and um, the Korean War, but uh, I'm not sure if there was uh, sort of a direct connection there. And the, the only guy who was really involved in both was Eisenhower, and he didn't really want to do it. We'll go to, uh, uh, thanks, Tom. Um, Alan Goldberg? Uh, um, you mentioned that uh, Kennedy was looking for a win. Was it von Braun who convinced Johnson that the manned lunar program was the way to go? Because von Braun, I, my understanding is, even back in Germany, he had in his mind a roadmap on how to get to Mars. And getting to the moon was part of it. Uh, I can't think of anybody else who might have had Johnson's ear and made the case for a manned mission. So uh, von Braun was a really important person in that decision, especially from the technical standpoint. So. Kennedy told Johnson, you know, find me a space program that promises dramatic results that we can win. It's a short one page memo. Johnson was the head of the Space Council at that time. Johnson then went and immediately met with all the relevant experts of the day. So he met with um, James Webb, the head of NASA. Um, he, he met with the Department of Defense. Um, he met with business leaders of the day. He met with members of Congress. He, um, uh, so Von Braun was brought into the mix. And so he was getting advice from a lot of people. Uh, what Von Braun did, which was really important, is he, he sent a memo that laid out um, sending humans to the moon from a technical perspective. And that was that was a really important document. It is worth noting that there were a number of studies um, for uh, sending humans to the moon um, that were undertaken the year before. And Johnson was involved in that as well. So um, during the Eisenhower administration, this was something that was looked at um, and uh, there were estimated costs um, and what it would take. Uh, and Johnson was involved in one of those studies. Um, and then also Kennedy had um, as part of his transition team, an evaluation of that as well. So the idea of sending humans to the moon, this was already sort of in the mix. Um, and so um, Brown is an important character, but also um, Lyndon Johnson is, and also some of these other people. Um, uh, McNamara said one of the reasons that he thought, you know, lunar exploration was going to be key is that it um, demonstrates the industrial capacity of the United States and of capitalism. And this is a, a great way to showcase American industry. And um, the, the Apollo program drew on a huge number of contractors uh, around the country and sort of American industrial ca capacity. And so for him, this was going to be a demonstration of that. So a lot of different people sort of um, were had their hands in sort of shaping that trajectory and that that goal. Um, Von Braun was one of them, and he he came to it with this lifelong passion for space flight, um, and that was that was important um, to sort of the larger effort. Okay, thanks, Alan. Uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, I had a question. Um, Nineteen sixty-three did. Khrushchev put forward a proposal to Kennedy about maybe jointly trying to go to the moon. I heard it was briefly considered anyway, but I 
didn't know anything about that or shed any light on that. So it was actually the other way around. Uh, Kennedy at two points, at least two points, proposed to Khrushchev that the United States go to the moon. Um, the Soviet Union joined the United States' efforts to send humans to the moon. So um, actually very shortly after Kennedy proposed Project Apollo for the first time, um, Kennedy met with Khrushchev and um, in June of 61, I believe, and he proposed this and Khrushchev sort of just <laughs> made some jokes and ended up um, promising Jackie Kennedy a, a dog that had, you know, part of a litter from one of the space dogs. And he actually did send it to Washington. So uh, when they got back to DC, you know, Khrushchev wasn't interested in going to the moon with the United States, but instead they got what they called a pup or they, they had a, they got a dog and then they ended up having pup nicks is what they called them. But um, sort of a funny part of that story. Uh, and But then Kennedy tried again um, uh, in 63. And um, if if he hadn't been assassinated, there's a big question of whether or not, um, whether or not he would have continued to pursue Apollo, whether he would have really pushed for a cooperative program. Um, but he was, Kennedy came into office thinking spaceflight is going to be great for international cooperation. That's how he saw the space program um, as a really important tool for for diplomacy in that way, um, and uh, and still hoped at various points throughout his presidency that it could be even a tool for diplomacy with the Soviet Union. Um, it didn't work out though. Thanks. Just curious, back on the patch, how did we get the patch wrong? <laughs> the shadow of the uh, was it a was it just not reviewed or was it just a quick quick sketch or <laughs> it's a funny thing because it went back and forth a number of times and um in so michael collins drew it and he used tracing paper and he used a um a national geographic bird book to, to get the eagle right um and he initially had the eagle looking in a way that that people reviewing it thought it looked too too menacing like it suggested that it wasn't a peaceful mission so they suggested adding an olive branch uh, to its talons and he thought that was ridiculous because eagle can't land with <laughs> an olive branch in its talons. so um so it was reviewed and there were you know a, a number of sort of back and forth but that that i think just slipped people by and maybe it was still the lack of familiarity uh, with what the the Earth like looks like from the Moon, um, it's funny because you can you can just sort of picture the Earthrise image that was taken um, during Apollo eight, and it and then you know where the shadow is supposed to be. But um, it is it is a funny slip up, but you you can see it. It's still the way the patch is produced now. That is that is cool. Now, do we have those sketches, his original sketches anywhere, or Michael Collins? Not that I know of. Uh, I hope they were saved, but I haven't. I haven't seen them. Uh, let's go to Kevin. Kevin Black. You... Yeah, no, no. I just was was wondering. You've mentioned so much about the political sides of things. I thought that there was a lot. I've read that there's a lot. Was a lot of interest in the the, uh, the program from the Defense Department because, of course, they were really wanting to develop missiles. Because I mean, we were in the race of getting with our missile technology of delivering you know, missile bombs and stuff like that. So. Anything you read about that or comment on that? Well, uh, one way Apollo was sort of important when it comes to national security is is helping develop a really robust um, aerospace industry within the United States. Um, so that that is one way that it contributed. Um, but I, if something like um, the Saturn V, it, it was sort of a a bit of a standalone. Um, rocket I, I it's, it's somewhat outside my area so I can't comment on that that too much um, when it comes to missile development but it was really important to sort of building up a, a really robust aerospace industry in the US okay thanks I'm look up and down the chat box we have we're a little bit over time but uh, uh, I want to give folks a chance if they have any burning questions and I didn't miss anybody so Maybe last call. Teasel, what artifacts uh, do you think, what artifacts do you think would surprise us that we have that maybe we haven't seen in, in your collection? Is there anything that jumps to mind? 
Um, there are, there are a number of fun artifacts. I, I actually, my first book was all, was, I selected 50 artifacts to tell the history of the Apollo program. It's called Apollo to the moon. And, um, so there are some fun ones in there, including things like, um, uh, a razor and, and it talks about sort of hygiene in, in space flight. They had an exerciser, uh, to use on the way to the moon called the exergenie and, um, some of those kinds of the small things. Most people know about the spacecraft, you know, the big, the big hardware, that kind of thing. But, um, some of the personal flown items tell sort of a different side of the program. Yeah. Frank's got a question too. So. Well, yeah, just uh, yeah, just a, a a quick question here. You know, the the Kevin's question up here brought to mind the Atlas and Titan rockets were both ICBMs. They were repurposed to launch the Mercury and Gemini missions, were they not? And then the Minutemans actually came on later. The Minutemans, I believe, were a improvement over the Titan rockets. Yeah. So, so for for early human spaceflight, they were really relying heavily on. Uh, the capacity within um, uh, within uh, sort of uh, the army and the navy, um, and so that's that's correct. Um, and sort of part of the question is, does it feed the other way around? Did Apollo then contribute back? But when it when it comes to like Project Mercury, the first American human spaceflight program, um, it was really important to use sort of uh, the launch vehicles of the day and they adapted them and that's part of how we ended up having the design for the friendship seven which i which i showed um that it is there are a number of things that went into that design but but one of them is that it was able to be adapted or to fit on on some of the um the missiles that were available All right, cool. I think we've run through the chat box. Uh, any last uh, calls? Are we still doing virtual? Uh, I think your, your your museum is open, or it's kind of virtual tours, a little bit of both, maybe. So the, the Udvar Hazy Center is open seven days a week now, so back to normal almost. I think you have to wear a mask. Um, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure of all the. Uh, I know what they require of staff. I don't know what they require of visitors. Um, right. but that, that's open. So if you if you go out there for observing at the end of the month, you can also um, come a little earlier and, and see the artifacts. The downtown location of the museum is undergoing a massive renovation, eight-year-long renovation. And so about half the museum is closed because of the renovation. And then, um, and then we have shorter hours, too. So it's basically, I think, Thursday through Monday right now. Okay. Well, it was it was really great to spend time with you tonight. I appreciate the time. Um, it was a it was a great topic. I enjoyed the book, and I'm sure uh, others will pick it up too. So, uh, um, really appreciate your time, uh, Teasel, and uh, we hope to see you at an observing event, maybe at Udvarhazi. I'm not sure, but we'll uh, we'll definitely catch up with you soon. And uh, and uh, we just thank you for your time tonight.